Hi everybody, I'm Girl Writes What, and uh, I was having a conversation with a friend uh, a week or two ago about benevolent sexism against women. He was asking me if I thought it was actually a thing, and uh, and after a lot of discussion back and forth with him, I, I kind of came to the conclusion that it's the only thing. Uh, that, that benevolent sexism against women is the primary, maybe even the only, form of sexism against women. In other words, um, it's, it's my belief that all sexism against women originates as a benevolent force based on one of society's and our biology's principal concerns that women should be provisioned and protected. Uh, this benevolent force can, of course, have negative consequences for a lot of women. And those consequences are what we generally uh, define as hostile sexism. Now, to explain things a little further, in my last video, I mentioned that uh, I thought that all men throughout history have really been exactly what women wanted and needed. And, and I really kind of want to explain my reasoning uh, a little bit further with that. Um, a recent study by a professor of ecology and evolution evolutionary biology at the University of Tennessee um, demonstrated by a mathematical model how our early hominid ancestors made the leap from the tournament model of social organization to a mostly monogamous model that is in many ways unique among animal species. This model was based on what would be described then as subordinate males cheating the existing system of male dominance and females' reproductive choices over time reinforcing that cheating. To clarify a little further, the tournament model of social, social organization is one where the majority of the offspring are sired by about 5% of the males. Mountain gorillas are a tournament species. Uh, the dominant male has a harem of females, he sires all the offspring, usually passes leadership to a son or successor when he dies. Um, however, most groups have only a single adult male. If another larger, stronger male comes along and kills or ousts him, uh, with very few exceptions, all the existing juveniles in that group will be killed. Uh, the females then all go into heat and the whole thing starts all over again. Now, baboons are another tournament species. They live in troops that always include other adult males, and they're most often comprised of several harems of four or five females headed by a dominant male. Now, a funny thing often happens with baboons. Sometimes a subordinate male will favor a particular female uh, that, who belongs to uh, someone else's harem. And, and he'll give her lots of extra social grooming and he'll share his food with her and he'll help her with her, her juveniles, with her children. And uh, she might return his expressed affections. Um, but she can't go and enforce her choice uh, of this other male on, uh, on this much larger, stronger head of her harem. And uh, so instead of doing that, which would just be doomed, what does she do? When she goes into heat and the dominant male begins to mate guard, and that basically means I'm not going to let you out of my sight, she will lead him all over the place. Every time he sits down to rest, uh, she will get up and go somewhere else. And uh, then he'll have to follow her. And then he'll sit down to rest again, and she will get up and she will wander off somewhere else, and he will trail after her. And eventually, he'll get so exhausted uh, that she can sneak away and, you guessed it, mate with that nice guy who has invested more in her and her offspring. Another tactic employed on the part of baboon females who want to uh, want to be with someone else, who want to have their choice of mate, um, is that she, she will actually lead the dominant male past another dominant male in the troop, another head of harem, over and over again, just parading him in front of this other male, back and forth, back and forth, until eventually the two of them will reach a point where they're going to have a confrontation, and she'll use that confrontation as a diversion to, you guessed it, sneak off and mate with that nice guy who invested more in her and her offspring. 
Now, this is essentially what that professor from the University of Tennessee suggests happened with our early hominid ancestors. And there are a few things that certainly support his conclusion, not least of which is our species' unique consensus that sex is something to be done in private, rather than out in the open without any care for who could be watching. If the first monogamous couples were actually people who were cheating on someone, and the price of getting caught cheating was getting your block knocked off, you're going to want some privacy. Humans are also unique in that we are egalitarian maters. And by egalitarian, I mean that all humans have the opportunity to pair bond and mate if they can manage it. There really aren't uh, a whole lot of restrictions as to who's allowed to and who isn't uh, the way there are, there are in most species of monogamous primates. Um, and there are some significant reasons why the model of monogamous and egalitarian has been so successful for us humans. One wise biologist uh, said uh, once that I'd give my life for two brothers or eight cousins. And, and there's really a lot of truth to that, in, the in that the degree of relatedness um, is very much at play when it comes to things like how much you're willing to invest in another individual, how much you're willing to help or protect them, and how much you're willing to put up with from them. In the case of that quote, the biologist shares four times as many genes with his brothers than he does with his cousins, and is therefore four times as invested in their survival and well-being. This instinctive tendency has also been demonstrated in one study done, I don't know how long ago, that determined that uh, fathers will invest more heavily in their children if those children physically resemble them. Now, in partially matriarchal or matrilineal societies like the Mosuo in China, the children of the lower classes are raised not by both parents, but by the mother and her family. Married couples don't live together, but have what are termed visiting marriages. And while the Mosuo seem to be relatively self-sufficient, they're isolated, and most villages don't even have electricity or running water. In addition, their social organization has been historically feudal, and married couples of the ruling class do indeed live together and employ parallel lines of patrilineal and matrilineal descent. It's been speculated that imposing a more matriarchal system on the serf class was a way for the ruling class to neutralize threats to their power. In other words, in the case of the Mosuo, Matriarchy, the elimination of paternal investment in offspring and strong pair bonding between couples, was seen as a way to weaken the social organization of the serf class so that the elites could more easily maintain the power to subjugate them. Now, what seems clear from observations of other species with respect to the degree of relatedness and the degree of investment and cooperation in other individuals uh, is that the male who will be the most invested in any given child is going to be that child's father. Degree of investment in each offspring will also often decrease the more children a male is capable of having. The male who has only a few will be more motivated to contribute and ensure that they all thrive, and each child will get a larger share of the father's resources and investment. Anthropologists have even gone so far as to speculate that the shift in human social organization to one of individual paternal investment was what led us to the conditions required for our leap forward in sentience and cognition. When everyone has to scavenge and scramble just to get by, getting by is often all they can do. Um, the surplus of resources available when men became wholly invested in their own offspring that was what gave everyone more time and energy to innovate, to learn, and to discover. So, right from the beginning, it was women who decided the course of human history and what the dominant model of our social organization would be. They decided it by rewarding the extra protection and provisioning of beta males, and evolution selected for that innovative model because it was the most successful, given the environment in which we lived. I can't state strongly enough my belief that the progress of human society, from hunter-gatherer to agrarian to industrial to post-industrial, 
has largely been built on the backs of those very beta males and their individual investment in their children. Without that, we'd probably have a lot more in common with our chimpanzee relatives than the 98% of our DNA that we share. So, how does this all circle back around to the question of sexism against women? Well, the monogamous egalitarian model of social organization is one built around the idea of provisioning and protection of women and children. Women are more successful at raising children if they have external provision and protection, and humanity prioritizes that requirement because the strongest reproductive model is the model that persists. The harsher the environment, the more swiftly the evolutionary losers are going to be displaced, annexed, or demolished by the winners, or simply fail all on their own. Now, up until an evolutionary eye blink ago, the prevailing conditions in which we existed were really different than now. Back before safe streets, a robust police force, safe comfortable transportation, leisure time, higher life expectancies, lower infant and child mortality rates, abundant safe easy indoor jobs, high literacy rates, social security and old age pensions, social safety nets, paternity testing, child support enforcement, birth control, baby formula, regulated daycare, social security numbers and re reliable birth and identity tracking, and a multitude of conveniences that took hours off of everyone's workday. Back before all of that, women with children were necessarily dependent on the willingness of individual men to take on the enormous burden of paternal responsibility, as well as the social burden of chivalry. And when you consider that uh, laws like coverture took protection of women to such an extreme that in an era of dozens of capital crimes and debtors' prisons, a husband was held criminally culpable for his wife's actions and debts, this burden was all the more onerous. A husband's obligations in an era of dangerous, strenuous physical labor, zero regulation of workplace standards, no such thing as workers' compensation, and literacy rates of less than 20% would have been extremely onerous to most men, and at the same time vital to the survival and success of women and their children. The only real power to enforce these obligations in the days of small government was the social pressure placed on men to take on that role. So, how do you get them to do it? By telling them that they're superior to women, and as a consequence of that superiority, they have a moral and ethical obligation to take responsibility for the care and protection of those inferior women and their children. By stroking their egos, you tell them how much bigger and stronger and smarter they are, and that Cupcake here would never ever be able to survive without a husband, and it's your duty as a big strong man to provide for her. To shirk this duty is to turn in your man card, because those fragile, delicate, silly women need a big he-man like you to take care of them. If you see one of those poor, inferior women in danger, you'd better be willing to step up and intervene, or we'll have to reevaluate just what we think of you. And if you do, well, there's a good man. All of that was benevolent sexism against women. And women have been complicit in it all through history, because it was of greater benefit than harm to them. And of course, it's very much a double-edged sword, because the assumption of inferiority that ensured most women in the past got what they absolutely needed out of men was precisely what made it impossible for a few women at the upper reaches of society to enjoy the independence their socioeconomic status could have purchased for them. It wasn't until our technological, social, economic, and political progress had reached the point where women were no longer quite so dependent on the willing investment of individual men for their bare survival that what had been benevolent sexism turned hostile to more and more women. The moment that the assumption of female intellectual, emotional, and physical inferiority became more harmful than beneficial to women, or harmed more women than it benefited, that assumption began to shift in our cultural consciousness. And what's happened? Over the course of a century, we've completely flip-flopped from a consensus that men are intellectually, emotionally, and physically superior to women, to one where women are intellectually, emotionally, and morally superior to men. The less necessary men's individual willing investment becomes to women, 
the swifter the immersion of the mainstream into a paradigm where the concept of woman is viewed as the ideal, and the concept of man subject to contempt, criticism, hostility, and distrust. Just ask Roger Ebert, Hannah Rosen, or any number of other writers who get space in national mainstream media. And what makes me believe so strongly that feminists have always had the causality of sexism against women backwards? That is, that its primary purpose has not been to oppress, but to elevate, uh, that it's always been benevolent, and that hostile sexism is simply the other edge of that knife, that women were not protected and provided for and sheltered because they were seen as inferior, but their, that their requirement for protection, provision, and sheltering was best served by viewing them as inferior. Well, who's considered inferior now? And yet, even though we now view men as emotionally and intellectually inferior to women, we don't seem willing to afford them the generosity of society's protection and provisioning, or our help and support, the way we used to do for women, do we? Instead, we're legislating ever more protections away from men, like VAWA and the Dear Colleague Letter, and more burdens onto them, like child support for children born out of wedlock, or smaller arrear sums uh, that will result in jail time. We tolerate politicians like Harriet Harman expounding on the unnecessariness of fathers, and we tolerate it at virtually the exact point in history that men were having their rights to their children stripped even further in UK courts, and even as the London riots were being blamed on absent fathers. At the same time, we're just as interested as we ever were in seeing women provisioned and protected, though different factions of society certainly disagree on why and how that should be managed, while traditionalists view this as the continuing responsibility of individual men and are willing to place expectations and limits on women who are taken care of in this way. Feminism has managed to perform a mainstream renegotiation of our pervasive benevolent sexism against women in such a way as to extract maximum benefit for women at little to no cost or limitation to women themselves. They demand women be fast-tracked into top jobs with women-only shortlists and gender quotas, all while claiming women are just as capable as men. They do this while simultaneously pushing for more social programs to assist women alone in areas where they're already advantaged compared to men, areas like homelessness, mental health, and violent victimization, because women are uniquely harmed by these things and therefore need more help. They demand that women be kept as safe as they'd be in a harem guarded by eunuchs, all while they participate in a culture of binge drinking and casual hookups, and all while demanding that none of the necessary limitations and responsibilities involved in making them safe should be borne by those women. And all of mainstream society scrambles to give them what they demand, even though it requires infantilizing those women and shoehorning men and government into the role of patriarchal caretaker. Through the gobbledygook of postmodernism, junk social science, the cunning employment of identity politics, and the construction of an invisible flying spaghetti monster known as the patriarchy, we've managed to externalize all of that benevolent sexism. Women still need extra help, provision, protection, and support, not because they're inferior, but because men are dangerous, dominating scum, while women are disadvantaged, and the invisible woo-woo patriarchy oppresses them. Women need more encouragement in school, even when they're dominating, more funding to start small businesses, even though more of them already do, more protections in sexual assault cases, even though none of the multitude of protections enacted since the 80s have managed to convince more women to report their assaults. More protection from battering husbands, even though women are more likely to instigate violence and face few real-world barriers to leaving. More anti-discrimination policies, more gender quotas, more workplace protections, more everything than men. Not because women aren't every bit as tough and strong and capable and intelligent and awesome as men. It's because patriarchy. It's not that women are inferior. Hell no. It's because they're still seen that way, even though they really aren't. While in the past women got a substantial informal discount in criminal court, from being charged to being convicted to serving time, 
because they were fragile little flowers who were too silly to know what they were doing and would never, ever, ever survive prison. Well, now they get a codified sentencing discount in the UK because society disadvantages women and privileges men. They need excuses made for them not because they're inferior, but because patriarchy. See how that works? And because we've, been, we've externalized our sexism in this way, as it relates to women, where we've defined women as part of an oppressed group and men as part of a privileged group, well, if a woman can't make it to uh, that board of directors chair, it was obviously because of discrimination. If she did make it, even if it was due to diversity policies, we still have to make a big deal, uh, pretending she's as good as any man there and will obviously just do, do just as good a job, even when the only available evidence tells us the opposite. If a man made it there, it was male privilege. If he didn't, even if it was due to the negative consequences of those diversity policies, well, it's because he just couldn't cut it. Women are strong, but they need extra protection and help, not because they're not strong, but because of invisible forces comprised of social pressures and cultural norms conspiring to keep them subjugated. Women are intelligent and capable, but they need more encouragement and school and gender quotas and employment, not because they're not intelligent and capable, but because the political machine and corporate structures don't value women's intelligence and capabilities the way they should, and they need to be made more women-friendly. If girls are lagging behind boys in math, it's the system that's to blame and it needs changing because girls are every bit as good as boys at math. But when boys suffer under those changes, it's because they're unable to adapt and what the hell is wrong with those little buggers anyway? If a man can't outperform a woman with one hand tied behind his back, he doesn't measure up and the moment he doesn't measure up, we don't have to care about him anymore. But if he does outperform her with one hand tied behind his back, he's an asshole oppressor who bullied his way to the top. Woe betide the man who holds open a coffee shop door for the wrong woman because he's not taking her strength and independence seriously. At the same time, society had damn well better hold career doors open for women, or you're going to hear about it. Do you see how all of that works? Our male-dominated society has always, always been gynocentric. The gynocentrism is where the male domination all came from. And all of that arose from a multitude of decisions on the part of women through history, right back to our early hominid grandmothers who manipulated and rewarded men and cheated the system to get the best possible deal at the smallest cost. And where does this leave men today? exactly where they always have been, scrambling to be what women want and need, or be invisible and unworthy of consideration, and being criticized and shamed when they fail. The difference now is that because the options and desires of women have become this huge, wide-open meadow of unlimited choice, filled with a million new and conflicting demands to place on men, being what women want and need is turning into an impossibility. Is it any wonder with all of these expectations and no one who could possibly live up to them, that women are getting less happy all the time. And uh, all of that said, I'm going to just leave you all with a link to a very apt bit of comedy by Brian Scott McFadden from an appearance he did a couple of years ago on Letterman. And uh, I'm going to challenge my male viewers to compile a list of... Uh, similar things that they would want in a woman, just for comparison. So, uh, I guess that's really all I have to say about that. And, uh, I won't be seeing you guys for at least a week, so, uh, I guess I will see you next Tuesday or Wednesday. <laughs>